Morning, everyone. Although this is asynchronous, so it might be afternoon where you're watching this. Hopefully you are watching this um, sometime Wednesday or maybe early Thursday because uh, we will be, uh, be assuming that you see it before Friday. But welcome to our first asynchronous version of the class. Um, as before, I am going to be referring to my book right here. But because we, ha we have the issue of um, some books haven't come in yet, I have copied a lot of the stuff onto the PowerPoint that I'm going to show you in just a second. In fact, why don't I call that up right now? And so I just want to say as far as this asynchronous stuff goes, um, I'm going to record it. I'm going to sort of go through assuming that you can pause and work on stuff. Um, but you do want to keep your book open. I think you'll learn better if you're looking back and forth to the book, to the different kinds of things that we are um, talking about. So with that, I want to go ahead and turn to chapter one. This first part, by the way, is biochemical thermodynamics. We are really going to first talk about thermodynamics, then we're going to talk about kinetics. Um, kinetics will be after we have our first test. So our first four chapters are going to be thermodynamics. Usually we have four chapters after that, but this year, because of the shorter quarter, I'm going to um, not do chapter 11, so we're only going to have three chapters. They're going to mostly be involving kinetics that will happen after the, um, the first test is over. And just want to remind you, anything you write down uh, can, will be useful for the test, so you probably want to keep that uh, in mind. There are going to be three, four homework problems, I can count, that we're going to be um, referring to this day. I'm going to uh, be assuming that you have these in open note form during the test, and so um, I might ask you a test problem that is similar if you have done a lot of the writing out of what the homework problem is, then I will be able to measure your answer and you'll be able to do that test problem a lot more easily. So remember that we had this very useful, I say that sarcastically, uh, homework problem, but it does show us that energy can be expressed either as kinetic energy, one half mv squared, or as this mct equation. Basically, the mass of the thing that you're talking about, the temperature that it's at, and then the C, which is the uh, some proportionality constant called the heat capacity. Technically, that should be C sub P, but you don't have time on this Reddit thread to actually write that down. Uh, so we're going to be talking about those different constants. It's a ratio between the joules that are put into a system and the way the temperature changes. If you're putting joules into the system, the temperature is going to raise. Uh, you can actually, for joules leaving a system, that will be how much the temperature drops. And different substances will have a different ratio between joules and degrees. And that's why you'll have a different C sub P for each of the different ones of those. So, the thing that we're talking about, if we're talking about heating up a chicken, right? We're talking about the system being the frozen chicken and then we're putting energy into it by slapping it, right? So we are transferring joules into the chicken and we're seeing its temperature raise. That means that we have a very well-defined system and surroundings. The chicken is the system, the hand and the, um, the air and everything else, the entire rest of the universe is the surroundings. It's always very important when you're starting to work on any physical chemistry problem that you are very clear about what the surroundings and the system are. By the way, there's some stuff that I'm going to go over kind of quickly because I think you picked it up from general chemistry. But um, if it's a little foggy and if you're struggling with how to set up problems, I recommend reading this first part of the chapter. For example, the figure that I'm showing you right now is figure 1.2 on page 24. That includes a lot of discussion about exactly the different kinds of systems. So you can have a system where you can exchange. The question is, what kind of exchange do you have with the surroundings? You could have a system that is completely isolated from its surroundings. It's all the way on the right. And so if you can't exchange, if it's closed off, if you have a test tube that's closed, corked on the top, you can't put anything in or out through the cork. So you can't have any matter going in and out of the system. If you have it in a thermos bottle, with like a, the best kind of thermos bottle is a vacuum, so you basically have zero contact between that system and the surroundings, then that system is completely isolated and you can't even have heat passing in or out. 
So the question is, can matter pass in and out, and can heat cast, pass in and out? If neither can pass in and out, you have an isolated system. If you have just a test tube and it's capped, you don't have any matter going in and out, but you can have heat going in and out. You can put that test tube in a water bath and heat it up. So that would be a closed system. Only energy can move in and out, only heat. Uh, and in fact, when I say E, I'm usually, usually we're talking about energy. When you're talking about work, you're usually talking about the volume expanding. So it's a little bit tricky, but I'm using the example of a non-expandable uh, test tube right now. If I have the test tube open and I can pipette stuff in and out, then I have an open system. I can add mass as well as have heat transferred in and out. And by the way, the reason why I say energy right here is because, like for example, I could illuminate a closed system and you can have light energy moving in. Honestly, most of our closed systems are going to be involving heat energy moving in and out. But I think the distinction between matter and energy is useful. It's also important to think about what kind of system is your body right now? We're going to be doing a lot of calculations with the human body. So think about that for a second. Which type of system would you say it is? So the answer to that is that your, your human body is an open system. That's because even though you're mostly closed by your epidermis, you have all these openings, especially your mouth and your nose and um, you know everything that is open if you have the system being ultimately open to the world, and your lungs are an open part, it's where you exchange matter, oxygen, with the environment, with the air that you breathe in. So the human body is an open system. Now, the human body has a lot of regulatory systems that try to keep the temperature the same, but we have to use energy to keep the temperature the same. So realize that the human body is kind of complex, but definitely it would be an open system. That's how we're going to, we actually have a few homework problems that deal with that. So the main thing is we're talking about um, forms of energy that can be moved in and out of the system. If you have a balloon, it's a closed system. And um, yet if I take that balloon and I heat it up or cool it down, then its volume will change. And that balloon is not just doing, um, uh, it, it's, it's not just heat that's, that's happening, you have a change of the size of the balloon. The volume change is actually pushing against the system, and remember that, that the surroundings are full of air pressure. And so if you have a balloon that I'm blowing up, and then I tie it up, and then I heat it or cool it down, the balloon will expand or shrink, and it will actually be doing uh, it'll be cooled down, and so you'll have heat moving in or out of the system. But it also will be, as it expands, it's pushing on the invisible air pressure. And that's actually a different kind of energy. Um, when you're pushing against an opposing force, that is movement in a particular direction, and that is work. It's a form of energy known as work. Heat, on the other hand, is random atomic movement. If you heat something up, the atoms are all moving faster, but they're moving in every single different direction at once. And so you can have an expansion or a contraction, but really on the atomic level, it's random atomic movement for heat that you're increasing or decreasing. For example, if instead of a balloon, you have a cast iron ball that you're heating up or closing down, that, that volume is not changing. It's not doing any work, but, it's, but the, if you heat it up or cool it down, then the um, atoms in the middle of it are actually moving faster or slower randomly. If you can see a particular movement, you can know that there's work going on. If there's movement in a particular direction, one-dimensional or three-dimensional, in the case of a balloon expanding. Now, because balloons are, dim are uh, expanding in 3D, and honestly, 3D math is kind of complicated, and we don't require it for this class, uh, we usually will take work situations and we will change them to one-dimensional situations, like the example shown here. We'll have, instead of being a balloon, we'll have it be a piston. And you have an example of a one-dimensional system, a uh, one-dimensional change, so there's one dimension of work going on in figure 1.4. By the way, that's on page 25. If you look at that, we have a, um, a, a system where we have urea in the test tube, and we have uh, you know, some oxygen in the test tube, 
when you, the urea is going to react with oxygen and when it reaches equilibrium, it might take a long time, but if you, you could combust it, you can get it going a number of ways or you can just wait a long time. Eventually that urea will react and you'll end up with CO2 and nitrogen and you'll end up with water in the bottom of the flask. Again, at equilibrium, when we let everything wait the longest amount of time possible, it's going to come to, from the state on the left to the state on the right at equilibrium. So uh, the question is, what's going on with the energy when that happens? Well, the chemical bonds are being arranged, and so you have, um, we're going to talk about what that means all over the next couple of chapters. Uh, when you look at the system as a whole, you can have heat being produced or taken up by the reaction. It can get hot or cold. The thing that you might notice with this particular reaction is it also will expand. You have three halves of a mole of oxygen on the left. You have one mole each of the two gases on the right. That means you have two moles of gases on the right. That means that you have more gas molecules. And if everything else is the same, you're going to have more pressure from those gas molecules, more gas molecules moving around and hitting the walls of the container. You will actually see this, if you run this reaction in a test tube, you'll see that it will actually expand. And if you have a little weight on top of it, you will see that it will push up on the weight and it will do work pushing that weight up. The most important thing, by the way, a lot of times, and I might do this accidentally, we use work and heat as nouns. You know, we talk about heat as this noun, this substance that we can pull out of the system and we can sort of isolate. That's not really accurate. There is no heat atom. Heat is a property of the system. Heat is not a separate element that we can take out. The same thing for work. So it's important to say when we talk about energy, we're really talking about work and heat as verbs, not nouns. They are verbs in that they are how things are moving. If they're moving, if you have all the atoms moving randomly more, you have an increase in heat. You have the, and you have to have had energy somehow being transferred into that movement. The heat is more like heating something up. The work is the substance is working. It's, that's better. And I may, you might catch me um, saying, using work and heat as a noun. Sometimes that's kind of okay, but remember conceptually, these are really verbs. These are not isolatable substances, but they are dynamic properties, and that's what energy fundamentally is. Okay? So, and if you think about that, by the way, which one is easier to do, work or heat? I want you to think about that for a second. Is it easier to move in a particular direction, or is it easier to just have stuff moving randomly to, um, if you are changing a system, is it easier to do work or heat? And if you think about this system right here, for example, it's pretty easy to just stick a thermometer in something and measure the heat of it. It's harder to set up a situ situation like this where you are measuring the work. And that's one hint that in general, heat is easier for the universe to do than work is. And that leads to a lot of uh, consequences. This is actually a chapter two type concept as well. And we'll get more into it when we talk about entropy. But I just want to say right now, there's two modes of energy transfer. One of them is easier than the other. And that one is heat. But they're both energy. They can both be represented as joules. And so we have a homework problem where we talk about exactly what kind of work can, is being done by this system right here. We have the work in a single dimension. If we have the work, this is a general thing for any chemical sample. So this is the three-dimensional work of expansion that you can see right here. If you have more pressure on the piston, um, basically imagine what would happen if we ran this exact same thing, but we increased the weight on it. You see the piston, if the re same reaction happened, the piston would go up less. There's more pressure on the, the piston, you'd have less movement, less volume expansion. There would be more of an opposing force. And you can think about this, the pressure, by the way, you can think about it as we're literally putting a weight on top of it, or it could be that the weight on top of it is the whole column of air that's above it, the air pressure. Remember, air pressure is like that big bar that we showed on the first day. 
the air pressure is pushing down on everything constantly. We're constantly under pressure. And so um, you have a situation like this where if you have something expanding against air pressure, then you have a force times a distance that is actually doing work as well. You can have a pressure times a volume, and that will give you joules units. And if you work out the units, if you have a single uh, dimension, a single meter's dimension that it's moving in against an opposing force, a force is pressure times area. And if you do all the things where you work out the different, uh, the different um, units, you will see that force times distance in one dimension gives you joules, just like pressure times volume does. That's what's shown by these equations right here. Homework 1.13, if you look at that, is going to actually do that. So we, we've actually taken that specific situation and we converted it to a case where if you have pressure over an area, you can calculate work as pressure times the change in volume, and or you can do it as distance times the opposing force, and the opposing force is pressure times area. By the way, this is the kind of physics that I'm not really going to be that interested in testing you on, but once you do the homework problem, you should be able to go back to that and see how it works, okay? So I want, just want to point out that this is the general way of expressing this. The other thing is notice that the work here is negative. The work, if you have the system expanding, it is actually pushing on the surroundings. And so energy, in a sense, is being expended by the system. It's being lost by the system, and it's going into the surroundings in some other form. That is why the work is negative. We are always calibrating ourselves to the system. And right here, the external pressure is what's pushing against us. We're pushing on that, and the, um, the negative expresses that. By the way, right here, this is one of the tricks to physical chemistry, and that's why I'm uh, pointing it out right here. So notice this as you do your homework, and notice that this is a thread. Is this positive or negative? And the question is, okay, you have uh, the energy moving. How is the energy moving between the system and surroundings? In the case of work against an external pressure, the energy is leaving the system. Therefore, we're calculating for the system, the work is negative. And by the way, as you're thinking about this, you are actually doing tons of little pushing yourselves. It's not exactly pistons, it's three-dimensional chemical, you know, electrochemical reactions. But you are pushing chemicals in a particular direction in your brain. As you're thinking and learning, and as you're focusing your attention, you are doing work. You are doing, you're pushing a force for a certain distance, and you are actually moving stuff in a particular dimension. Uh, dimension. You're also producing heat, by the way, and your brain gets hot, as you think. Um, but that is hopefully, that's random, so that's not really learning. Learning is literally work. And just sitting there thinking, by the way, even as wherever you're thinking, and that's why it's important as you're doing this, you know, try to focus on this. The more you work to focus your attention on this asynchronous lesson right now, the more your neurons will be pushed in the right direction. And that work will actually be saved. When you go to the test, you'll know something, how to deal with a certain problem that you didn't before. I always like to show this. You know, uh, it always surprised me that grandmasters in chess train like athletes do. But then I thought about it a little bit, and I'm like, well, athletes are doing work with their bodies. Grandmasters are doing work with their minds. And it's just you can't see the atoms being pushed and uh, one-dimensional changes. But there is a physical component to it. And so if you, um, so make sure that you're eating well, you know, things like that, because as you think and learn physical chemistry or do chess, you will expend a lot of energy. The more you think, the more your brain works. And because it's work, it's force times distance, and it's going to heat things up and things like that as well. It's going to be doing work and heat. And the question is, how much energy is being put there? The really cool thing is that you can actually measure that in joules. If it's literally work, then that means it is literally energy, force times distance, and literally joules going on. So you can measure it, and you can say that two hours of sitting and playing chess 
burns as much calories as Roger Federer burning in an hour of playing singles. So not, you know, that's physical exertion. And so that's what work is. That's how you can express work in joules, force times distance or pressure times change in volume. Heat, on the other hand, how do you express that? Well, you know that you take a thermometer and you measure the heat, how hot something is. And that is a measurement of the random movement. Remember that we have the Boltzmann distribution. This also has a physical component. The physical component has to do with random speed of the molecules. And the speed is velocity of a very small bit of matter. It's uh, meters per second of a bunch of different uh, matters and uh, forms of matter. And so Boltzmann figured out how to use the spacing of the energy levels to integrate over the whole population and figure out what does this whole population look like when I have a big population of atoms. They're all moving randomly. Because they're moving randomly, some are randomly moving faster and some are randomly moving slower. Identifying which ones are which is actually a lot of work and we don't need to do that. What we need to say is, for this, what is the distribution of speeds how many atoms do we have that are moving really fast versus really slow? And the thing I want to point out about this, we showed this before, and this is actually in the last page of Foundations if you want to flip back to it. Boltzmann provided a molecular theory. It's a molecular description for how fast are the atoms moving in a population of atoms that is at a certain temperature. He had this equation, and the main thing about this, this is an exponential equation, that is dependent on t. You see the t right there. There is a um, t to this. It's dependent on t. It's dependent on the energy level spacings. And it's also depend. and it will tell you how many things are in the top level as opposed to the bottom level. When you have a sample with a whole bunch of energy levels, that's actually something you can get to by just doing the calculus. We actually used to do that, that calculation in the class, but we don't really need to go that much into calculus I just want you to know that it's possible. And if you're really curious, I can uh, copy the pages from the earlier edition that actually took you through the calculation. You're actually not that far from doing it. But the fact of the matter is you have to understand the result, not the process for this. The main thing about this is notice that each of these bell curves, it's not really a bell curve because they're, um, they have higher high ends than they do low ends. But each of these curves has an average and that's what you're measuring with the temperature. If you're at a low temperature, then you're measuring that one number right there, and you're measuring the average of the distribution. If you're at high temperature, you measure a higher number. And that means that the, the uh, average is higher, but you also have the curve as a whole is more spread out. And you have even more um, atoms on the right side and so you, ha you have a certain number of atoms with a certain speed and therefore a certain kinetic energy. Remember, if something has a V, then it's going to have a kinetic energy in joules, one half mv squared. And so this is actually really useful. We can take this and we can say how many, what percentage of my sample has atoms that ha are moving faster, that have a kinetic energy above a certain threshold. And we are going to return to that idea as well. So the main thing is, we're talking about energies with both work and heat. They're both measured in joules. And I have to tell you the story about Joule. It's named after the original scientist. I forget his first name, but his last name was Joule. And he actually worked for a brewery. The family's business was making beer. And so you have these big vats of liquid, and you actually are interested in controlling the temperature of this. One of the things that people always notice is as you were stirring these vats, they would heat up automatically stirring them with a macroscopic motion would result in some kind of microscopic motion that would be the random motion of heat. And so um, he was curious about this. He wanted to be a scientist. And so what he did is he hooked up, hook, hooked up weights to the stirrer and he like, would put a weight on the stirrer, let the weight fall. See, he would standardize how much stirring was there and realize that the weight falling is an expression of potential energy against the force of gravity. The force of gravity times the distance that the weight did is the mgh equation that we have. That gives you joules. And he figured out that if I standardize the, the amount of energy I put in by the amount of weight and the distance that it moves, 
it will be related to the amount that the temperature is raised. He connected the weight dropping work to the um, vat raising heat through the stirring mechanism. So that what this says, I want to give you an equation for this. The equation is right over here. For the system of vat water, remember that we have got to define the system. The system is being stirred. Energy is being transferred from gravity, in a sense, to the random molecular motion of the vat. That means that the work is uh, the negative amount of the work being done on the system is equal to the rise in heat that is being gained by the system. And uh, the Q here is positive. The work is being put into the system, by the way. That is why it is negative. The work is going into the system. When work leaves, um, uh, and uh, so that's one of the things I, um, we've got to be very careful. The work in this case is being done in the surroundings and being transferred to the system. It's transferred to the system as heat. And in fact, this goes back to the whole thing that we were saying, heat is not an element. They used to think it was. They called it caloric, and they were trying to measure how big are the caloric atoms, what mass do they have, how do they move in and out. And the question, is, the point is, no, it's actually an atomic motion. It's how the atoms are moving in general. It's not an element moving in and out. The uh, the experiment that really proved that this is true, that there's um, that the heat is just motion on a very atomic scale is this where you actually, uh, it's again involving a piston, and they um, this Count Rumford in 1797 hooked up a piston to a, in a vat of water again to a bunch of horses, and he had the horses go around, and they would turn the, the piston, and it would make a huge amount of heat by friction. This would put enough heat into the water to actually eventually boil it. This means there's no way to explain this with heat being a substance or an element. Heat must be a process. It must be a property of motion, a change of motion rather than a change of mass specifically. And so there's more about this in this particular article. Um, you can find out about the whole story, and I think it's really interesting. But we still have the same sort of misconception today because it's natural to think when something's hot, it's natural to think of, oh, what's moving between here and there, and are there atoms moving? Well, the primary thing that's moving is just the general random motion of all the atoms. There's not a specific kind of atom that is like the hot atom, okay? Atoms can get hot or cold. And so this idea of heat being transferred into work shows up in these homework problems right here. I want to give you these, and I want to say these are related to what we had before, where the work against an external pressure the work done by a system against an external pressure by an expansion or a contraction, honestly, will be given to you by this equation right here. Now what they do with this is that you can actually take, you notice that you have PV. You can actually take this equation and you can do PV equals NRT and you can turn this from work equals negative P external times delta V to this one that I have below it, which is Q equals nRT times the natural log of VF over VI. Again, how we do this is something that we're skipping this year. This is the result of doing calculus and actually integrating, but um, we're not going to worry too much about that. I'm just going to give you this result, and I'm going to give you this equation, and I'm going to say this equation is what you should use for 1.16. Notice, by the way, that you have a volume in the problem, you have a N in the one mole of air molecules, and you have a T already converted for you to Kelvin units, which is nice. At this point, it's kind of a plug and chug problem. Um, there's just a few little wrinkles to get. The other thing is down below, you see that you have a, uh, a laboratory animal is a system on the 117 problem. Uh, and, but you do have pulleys, and you have a mass being raised so you have the energy for the mass being raised equals mgh. G is the acceleration of gravity, h is the height it was raised or lowered, and m is the mass. So as long as you're careful about pluses and minuses for whether the energy is leaving or entering the system, you can see right here the animal lost 
five joules of energy as heat. That means the, the surroundings gained five joules of energy as heat. There's only two things, system and surroundings, so you can't um, worry about uh, the, the other parts of that. So the question is, from this calculation, you can calculate the change in internal energy for the animal. That's the one thing that we haven't said. What is the internal energy of the animal? Well, the change in internal energy is just the change in any time of, type of energy. And like we've talked about, the two major kinds of energy exchange are work and heat. So internal energy is how is the work and heat of the animal changed? And so you can do experiments like this. You can do experiments where the system, and if you carefully control the surroundings, you can do specific systems where the system is a, um, is a human being or a mouse, and the surroundings are measured and controlled very carefully. These are called metabolic chambers, and you see here you have a reporter that talks about a story. Uh, you don't have to read the story unless you're interested. You can do it on your own time. But it's about what it's like to be uh, like this. Now notice that this is not an invasive test. You are measuring what's going on in the system by measuring what's going on in the surroundings. You don't have to actually go inside the system in any way here, but you have to measure the breath that comes out, the heat that comes out, the number of breaths, and you, you can also measure things like heartbeat and things like that as well. But it's really cool to me because the human body is an open system. It's exchanging matter and energy with the surroundings. If you can measure the matter and energy of the surroundings precisely, you can measure what's going on inside the system without having to actually go inside the system at all. That's one of the cool things, and that is physical chemistry. System, surroundings, heat, work. So getting back to Jules Vatt, um, how much did the temperature raise? And he was, of course, working with mostly water systems, a little ethanol in them as well. Uh, and he noticed that how much weight he put on the pulley, if he put more weight on the pulley, it would heat up more. And also, if he had a vat with more water, it would take longer for that water to heat up. Clearly, the amount of heat that you put in depended on how much water there was for the temperature to raise. This makes intuitive sense to us, but it means that there is a connection between the joules being put in and to it as heat, being transferred in um, as heat and the change in temperature. And that change is going to be different depending on how much water you have and whether you have water, if he was able to do it with pure ethanol, he'd measure a different amount, even if he had the same volume or mass of water and ethanol. So clearly there's a proportionality constant that depends on the system itself. What is the property of the system? And it's like when you put this much heat into the system, how much temperature changes as a result? Some systems will change really quickly and easily. Some systems will take a lot more joules that you put in to get a similar temperature range. Uh, and so right here we have an example that's exactly like this. The uh, proportionality constant is called the heat capacity. It has, um, it's just part of the simple equation right here. And so that means it has units that will cancel out with the joules for the Q and the, um, the Kelvin for the delta T. And so you can work out something like this. You could do that for a beaker of water or for a joules vat or things like that. And you can convert joules to t a change in temperature for a system. The important thing is dep it depends on what the system's heat capacity is. No matter how complex the system is, you can actually measure it for any system as long as you um, measure it. It's just a proportionality constant. You measure how much, you, how much heat you put in, how much does the temperature rise. Nothing else matters for that particular system. And so you can see that we have heat capacities for uh, several different substances. And if you look up and down here, water has a pretty high heat capacity. There are some other things that have higher heat capacities, but notice that those all are pretty big molecules relative to water. Water, for being such a small molecule, actually has a high heat capacity, higher than air, for example. Um, and if you have it as the liquid form, it has a super high heat capacity relative to the solid and gas forms. So um, for right now, for chapter one, what we do is we find the heat capacity, and then you can, once you find it for the system, you can calculate, you can go back and forth. You can calculate joules from a change in degrees or a change in degrees from joules.
And by the way, the other thing is that because we're involved with gases and we're under pressure and things like that, um, there actually will have differences in the heat capacity depending on if you are keeping the pressure constant or if you're keeping the volume constant. Keeping the volume constant is easier for math, and so we'll start with a constant volume example. But keeping the pressure constant is easier for chemistry because what's easier than have, if you have a beaker that's open to atmospheric pressure, well, the, the whole atmosphere is huge. You aren't changing the atmospheric pressure. It's staying constant. And so you are at constant pressure if you have a beaker open on the counter. And so we're always going to start in some cases with the constant volume uh, calculation, but then we'll move to the useful calculation, which is the constant pressure calculation. So if we um, get to what's going on with the atoms, well, you heat them up, and some atoms have, um, they, they move more when you heat them up. And so the heat capacity somehow connects the Q and the delta T. And so this is a, a molecular interpretation, and notice it has to do with energy levels. We actually can calculate the energy levels, the spacing of the energy levels has to do with the heat capacity. So I want you to see right away, this is why we talked about the Boltzmann distribution and that N1, N2 re, um, equation. We can actually talk about the different spacings of energy levels in different substances that result in different heat capacities. That gives us some hope for understanding what's going on on the molecular level for doing a calculation like what Boltzmann did. He connected fraction of, um, fraction of molecules with speed. Well, maybe we can do a similar calculation where we can connect other kinds of energy levels, rather than being speed energy levels, the velocity energy levels, they can be heat capacity energy levels. And so I know that we're just introducing this, but we're going to be talking about this in pretty much every chapter. This is where it is right now. This is actually, this will, will take some thinking, this will take some work for your neurons. So the, the thing about the spacings is that lighter atoms have a lower CP. And they'll tend to, if you transfer a joule of energy into a sample of lighter atoms, you will tend to move them more. So putting that together, that actually has to do with lower heat capacity means that the energy spacings that are affected by putting joules of heat into the system are wider. You have the system on the right as opposed to the system on the left. A higher heat capacity, let's say you have a sample of metal versus a sample of um, of water, and in fact, to make it even more extreme, maybe a sample of metal versus a sample of air, perhaps. Uh, let's just say, uh, you know, a lighter atom versus a, a less light atom. Let's say a, a less dense atom, which will have a lower heat capacity, like aluminum, versus a higher heat capacity, which will be something like, uh, something like gold, perhaps. Hopefully I'm right that, but um, the heavier atoms tend to have higher heat capacities. And so um, lighter atoms will have a lower CP. And the thing is, if you have, if you work out what the spacings are, the N1 over N2 for an entire sample, if you have the N1 over N, or the, the delta E for the entire sample, if the delta E is smaller, then you will have the atoms being filled up by energy. And the thing I want to show you right here, notice that we have smaller delta E's on the left here. If we have a sample, let's say it's cold, we're going to have more atoms at the lower, uh, at the lower energy than if we heat that up. We're going to be moving atoms out of the lower energy uh, samples and moving them to the higher ones. Great. And if you take a sample it, that's cold, it's the blue line, you heat it up, you put joules in, it becomes the red line. Notice that the red line ends up with moving, at the lower levels it moves this way, at the higher levels it moves that way, okay? Uh, and so you have more atoms at the higher energy levels, and that's true for the lower heat capacity as well. But because the lower heat capacity the higher heat capacity has lots of levels right there. So you're moving them up, but they're not moving up as much when you move them up. So that means you have a smaller delta E that you're moving them up. You're going to have a distribution where you have, you still have many of the atoms at lower energy levels. 
for the lower heat capacity situation, your delta E is bigger. And that means you're going to be, when you heat the sample up, you're going to be moving, you're going to be moving the, the, the atoms from the lower levels to the higher levels. The number at the lower levels will go down, and you see at the very bottom, you see the, um, the line is definitely moved, but it's moved a lot more at the bottom, which means that you have the more atoms at the higher energy levels. Notice how it's moving more, so that means you have more fewer, and this is, this is a little bit tricky to talk about in this situation. You basically have a bigger difference between the blue and red line when you have bigger energy spacings. And that means that the heat capacity, the atoms will be moving more, and you will end up with a higher measured temperature. Remember, the temperature is sort of the average of all the atoms. If you have more of the atoms being moved up to higher energy levels, then you will actually see that average uh, go up more. The thermometer that you stick into the sample on the right will go up more than the thermometer that you stick in the sample on the, the left. Even though they have been increased by the same number of joules, the atoms are moving faster in the one on the right. So see what I said about learning being work. Look at this section. Read Atkins on this particular section. This is the toughest concept in this whole chapter but it is a unifying concept for our entire class. And if you don't entirely get it yet, okay, sit on it, come back to it. And we'll actually have other examples of energy levels and properties, how they deal with Boltzmann distributions like this. And this is one of the things I want to work on. One of my goals for this whole class is for this stuff to make more and more sense to you. This is really interesting. And uh, so I just want to show water has a really high heat capacity. It's one of the really kind of interesting things about water, that it doesn't have to have such a high heat capacity until you look at its molecular properties, but it's weird, you know, compared to ethanol, compared to benzene, compared to other things. Because water has a high heat capacity, that means it's like the thing on the right rather than the thing on the left. Or, I said that wrong. Let me go back. Water is like the thing on the left. It has a high heat capacity with close together energy levels. And he explains this is because water has hydrogen bonds that pull the atoms together and makes them vibrate together. And that means that their energies for vibration are closer together. And so the energy levels are closer together. Because water has hydrogen bonds that cause the energy spacings of the vibrational modes of motion to be closer together, the water has a higher heat capacity. Something like benzene would be more like something on the right. Water is more like one on the left. Again, read this, sit with this, think about this. We don't have the ability to go to a complete description of this because we have only one quarter. Um, but this is actually related to all the equations for motion and for bonding that we can talk about. Okay, I'm spending more time on that. So I do want to go through and get you to the rest of the calculations that we do with heat capacity now that we've talked about the theory. The only thing that, um, the, the thing that I mentioned before that I want to, to talk about is heat and work are path dependent. That means that if you, you can choose how you move heat and work in and out of a system, and you can m choose to have more heat or more work depending on how you move the energy. A great example of this is a battery. If you have a battery, you can discharge that in any combination of heat or work that you really want. If you put it into a light bulb, you're going to actually turn that into some radiant energy, but you're also going to turn it into some heat. The light bulb's going to get hot. You're not going to transfer that into much work. There's not much expansion going on. If you put the battery into sort of a space heater radiator, it will take that battery energy and it will release it completely as Q, heat energy. And if you put it into a fan, the fan will um, actually move. And you'll see the movement. That means the fan is doing work. If you put the battery into a fan, you'll see a lot of work being done. And you'll also see a little bit of heat. Remember, heat is easier to do than work. And even if you want to just do work, you'll usually get a little bit of heat coming out. That's why fans will actually, the motors will release a little heat, sort of by friction and by accident. That's more of a chapter two concept, but the important thing is one battery can be used 
to transform that energy into heat or work. The battery has a certain number of joules. And so while we can choose how, much we, how many joules we put into work, how many joules we can put into heat, we can't choose whether the joules will be, we can't like expand the joules, you know, we can't like uh, change the total amount of energy that's there. We can just choose which path it takes. So the interesting thing about joules overall is if we look at the battery overall, we can say it has this many joules in it and we'll get the same number of joules out depending on how many joules we put into work and heat, but we'll always get the same number of joules stored in that battery. The battery's energy is path independent. This is actually one of those things that's philosophically very interesting, but I really can't take you down that road this quarter. But it's really interesting that we have these two path dependent quantities that we're used to, but they can be expressed as a path independent state function. The cool thing is we can do calculations for that battery and they will be true for whatever use we put that battery to. This is very useful because that means we can talk about the internal energy of that battery. And that's something that is universally true. I like to think that's what the U means, although I'm really not sure what the U means. Universally, the universally true energy that's in the battery. And so let's say that, let's take a situation of the vat water again. As the T is raised, the internal energy goes up. We have a Q being transferred into the system. We have a delta T, but because the Q is being put into the system, the delta U is also going up. The Q is being put in. And in fact, if we have a system that we're just putting Q in, we're not doing any work on it, then the Q is going into the system and that delta U equals the Q and the, the W equals zero. And so we can express this as Q plus zero over delta T instead of delta U. That Realize that there's a very simple equation, delta U equals Q plus W. But we can use that in many different ways. So because uh, if we have a situation where we just have heat going in and out of the system, we can actually relate the Q and the delta U through uh, an equation like this. As the temperature goes up, the internal energy goes up. Great. But how does it go up? It goes up uh, according to a curve, and Atkins just has a curve right here that doesn't really, um, the curve's shape itself doesn't really mean much beyond the fact that it's going up. But you can actually measure U the joules into the system if you know the T and the heat capacity. The equation above, uh, uh, up there shows you how you can do that, and the plot over here shows you how the heat capacity relates to U. Delta U over delta T is what you say if you have a ma macroscopic change, a delta. But if you remember your calculus, you can make that into a infinitesimal change, a DU over DT. And that just means an infinitesimal slice. If you have um, the, the, at a particular point on this curve, the slope of the curve at that point is the dy over dx. This is a u versus t graph, and so it's du over dt. And so the point, the, at this point right here, I believe you can see my pointer, um, the, the du over dt at that point is the heat capacity. This is actually something that falls out of the equations, and this is the main way we'll be using calculus this quarter. If we have a delta, if we have two points and we're changing from one u to another u, we have a delta u, and we can put that into this equation. If we bring that delta down to a d at a particular point, and we have the slope of the line tangent to the curve at that point. That slope is also du over dt, and that slope is also the heat capacity. Now, the one thing about this is this is true for constant volume. If you go into the equations for this, it's in the textbook, but I'm not going to go into it. This is true for constant volume. But, okay, that's great, but if we're talking about Joule's vat, he wasn't working at constant volume, he was working at constant pressure, assuming the vat was open to air pressure. And that means that we have another issue to talk about. We have a way that that system can produce work. If any gas is produced, or if any even evaporation happens, 
the gas that is produced will push on the air and it's pushing on the surroundings and it's doing work. It's pushing up the weight of the, of the air above it. In effect, it is raising a weight by expanding gas. So that means that the U of the, an open vat is equal to the Q of the heat being put into plus the work of expansion, whatever expansion happens against the atmosphere. We are no longer at constant volume, but we are at constant pressure. And it turns out that if we just make a little change to our U equation, we can actually account for this and we can get a state function that can express the energy inside the system as a, um, as a function of its, its heat for an open system. And the thing is, it's a really simple equation. Like most of our equations, it's simple to see, but it's hard to use. That's why I test the way I do, by the way. The test will see how you use the equations. I don't really care how you remember them. I want you to use them. And so right there, you have for one state, the enthalpy of that state is equal to the internal energy plus PV, plus pressure times volume. And if you, that's the expansion work. In fact, if you have a delta H against constant pressure, you have a delta U and a delta V, but you have constant pressure, so the P stays the same. You don't have a delta V, uh, a delta P by definition. So for a change in state, you have that. And for an infinitesimal change, you would have dH equals du plus p dv. And so that's our final thing. That's what I want you to get to. What is enthalpy? It's heat at constant pressure. And so uh, the, the um, delta H equals the, this delta U universal energy type thing, which is W plus Q plus P delta V. Remember that we had that before. The work done against an external pressure by expansion is just the pressure, the air pressure, PEX, -E times the change in volume. So if we do that, and if we take our delta U equals W plus Q, and we plug that in there, and then we realize that the W that's going on is negative PEX delta V. So we plug that in for W. So we do this plug in, we get this equation at the bottom. We end up with this right here. We have a negative PEX um, times delta V plus Q and a positive PEX delta V. And that means that delta H ends up being just Q. These cancel each other out. And you end up with this very simple equation, but it's why we do it because we're essentially canceling out the term that's giving us problems. We defined enthalpy in such a way that the, ex the work against an external pressure cancels out. And so therefore, if we have an open beaker at constant pressure, then um, we define the enthalpy as the heat of transferred into or out of that system. Now realize that if we do the same graph as we did before, we have the same graph and we have the, the U um, versus T, it, the, the line of U on the Y axis versus T on the X axis is going to be, um, is going to be like this, uh, is like the yellow line before. And if at every point we have our H, which equals U plus PV, well, P and V are both positive numbers. Remember, we're talking about single states, so we're, you can't have a negative volume. You can't have a negative pressure. Um, ideal gas law type calculations, single state calculations, P and V are always going to be positive. That means your H line is always going to be above, and you're always going, your CP line will be, will be exactly the same as the CV was. It just will be the tangent of the slope, the dH dt of the slope right there. And that's how you do. Homework 118, by the way, um, I tried to put that on there. And that involves doing this calculation. Now, I just want to leave you with one last little example. Uh, this is a product you can actually buy called Coffee Julies. All they are is little stainless steel things. They shape them like beans just for fun but it just has to be a stainless steel nugget. And what that does is those have a certain heat capacity. And what they will do is they will actually hold on, because metals have really high heat capacities, it's higher even than liquid water, and the metal will actually increase the heat capacity of the system, and it will allow the heat from the metal to exchange with the heat of the system. And that will actually keep your coffee warmer for hours.
Although when we're talking about for hours, we're talking about time units. And so I can't have you do a calculation like this, but I want to show you how these work. They work because stainless steel has a heat capacity. I think if you'd make them out of solid gold, you would have even higher heat capacity and you would actually end up with, um, with even faster working and longer working coffee jewelies. But uh, who has, if you want to get stainless, or if you want to get golden coffee jewelies, that's your business. I don't think it's really necessary. I'm not sure that they're necessary. So that brings us to all of our homework that we have, just four homework problems. Please work on these. Try to get them done before the next lecture, although they won't be collected until Monday. If you're looking at the book, which I encourage you to do, we've gone up to section 1.6. That's an instrumental analysis section. When you run into an instrumental analysis section like that, skip it. I mean, you can look at the pictures to see the cool things, but it really has details that we aren't getting into in this class. We'll start up with section 1.7. If you want to go ahead and look at that before we get together, and we will have a synchronous class, and um, hopefully uh, we'll do it like this again, and I'll have some questions for you. So why um, I look forward to actually seeing you then and actually having people to talk to rather than just a camera. So with all that in mind, um, I think I did actually come in roughly at about 50 minutes, and uh, so I hope, I hope this asynchronous class worked for you. Let me know. As always, everything with this is flexible. Let me know how it's working. Keep in touch. Let me know what homework problems you have because that's what it's all about. And we will get to the next ones, which will be quite familiar, by the way, on Friday. All right.